Chapter Two of In Kent with Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. In Kent with Charles Dickens by Thomas Frost. Chapter Two. Our eyes opened next morning upon another bright day, and as though the distance from Gravesend to Rochester, the predetermined goal of our second day's pilgrimage, is only seven miles. There was much to be seen in that ancient city. We lost no more time before resuming our journey than was necessary to the satisfactory disposal of an excellent breakfast. Passing through chalk once more, and turning to look at the little ivy clad church when we had got a mile farther, we ascended a gentle rise, with occasional glimpses of the Thames on our left, and a charming panorama of woodland scenery on our right. Gad's Hill, now as intimately associated with the name of Dickens as with that of Shakespeare, was reached in about an hour, and those associations were held to justify a halt. Footnote. Near the twenty-seventh stone from London is Gad's Hill, supposed to have been the scene of the robbery mentioned by Shakespeare in the play of Henry the Fourth there being also reason to think that it was Sir John Falstaff of comic memory who, under the name of Old Castle, inhabited Cooling Castle, of which the ruins are in the neighbourhood. At a small distance to the left appears on an eminence the Hermitage, the seat of Sir Francis Head, and close to the road, on a small ascent, a neat building lately erected by Mr. Day. History of Rochester, 1772 On the Hermitage estate there are now two houses, called the Great Hermitage and the Little Hermitage, the former of which was the residence of Perry, of the Morning Chronicle, in the palmy days of that journal. The neat building lately erected by Mr. Day was at one time supposed to be Gad's Hill Place, but that supposition has since been found erroneous. End of footnote. The sign of the Sir John Falstaff swinging before a wayside hostelry was as suggestive of Shakespeare as was the comfortable-looking red-brick house called Gad's Hill Place of Dickens. Gad's Hill Place, which has been made familiar to the reading world by the woodcuts in Mr. Forster's biography of the novelist, is a plain, old-fashioned red-brick house of two stories with a wooden porch and a bell-turret on the roof. It was built in 1780 by a well-known character in this neighbourhood, an illiterate fellow named Stevens, who had been a hostler, and having had the good fortune to marry his employer's widow, became a brewer, made a fortune, and was elected mayor, or as he wrote it, M-A-R-E, of Rochester. At his death it was bought by a gentleman named Lynn, and leased to a sporting clergyman of the Regency days named Townsend, who was succeeded in its occupancy by another clergyman, the Reverend Joseph Hindle, then and still rector of Higham, in which parish the house is situated. Dickens bought the house towards the close of 1856, and obtained possession in the following March, becoming, as he wrote to Mr. Forster, the Kentish freeholder on his native heath, a description which, while it evinced the exuberance of feeling which he experienced on becoming the owner of a house on which he had long had a longing eye, was not quite accurate, as though he had been brought up at Chatham, he was a native of Portsmouth. His first act of proprietorship was to hang upon the wall of the landing the following framed inscription illuminated by Owen Jones. This house, Gad's Hill Place, stands on the summit of Shakespeare's Gad's Hill, ever memorable for its association with Sir John Falstaff in his noble fancy. But, my lads, my lads, to-morrow morning by four o'clock, early at Gad's Hill, there are pilgrims going to Canterbury with rich offerings, and traders riding to London with fat purses. I have visits for you all, you have horses for yourselves. Dickens made considerable additions and improvements both to the house and grounds. 
there was a shrubbery of which two noble cedars were conspicuous ornaments, but the high road divided it from the ground surrounding the house, and it was desolate and neglected. Dickens had a tunnel made to connect it with the front lawn, and erected in its leafy seclusion the Swiss chalet presented to him by Mr. Fechter. "'I have put five mirrors in the chalet where I write,' he wrote to an American friend, "'and they reflect and refract in all kinds of ways the leaves that are quivering at the windows, and fields of waving corn, and the sail-dotted river. My room is up among the branches of the trees, and the birds and the butterflies fly in and out, and the green branches shoot in at the open windows, and lights and shadows of clouds come and go with the rest of the company. The scent of flowers, and indeed of everything which is growing for miles and miles, is most delicious. From Forster's Life of Charles Dickens When the old bridge at Rochester was demolished, the contractors presented the novelist with one of the balusters, which he set up on the back lawn, and on the top of which he placed a sundial. Many interesting memorials were dispersed at his death, but the house remains, and after nine years' occupation by his son, has lately passed into the possession of Captain Austin Budden, of the Twelfth Kent Artillery Volunteers. Dickens' love of long walks through the lanes and the fields and the woods was a trait of his character with which his biographer has made all appreciative readers familiar. Note has been made in the preceding chapter of his rambles to Shorn and Cobham and Chalk, and these were among his most favourite walks. But many were also the lunches and dinners of which he partook, when friends were staying at the place, in the cherry orchards and hop gardens of this beautiful county, and the excursions made to more distant spots, among which was Bluebell Hill near Ellsford, and in the immediate neighbourhood of the remarkable druidical monument called Kit's Coty House. One of his longest pedestrian rambles, only made in the autumn, when the stubble could be crossed, commenced at the lane leading to Higham, in which stands the blacksmith's forge, from which the feu de joie was fired, equally to his surprise and gratification, on the occasion of his younger daughter's marriage with Mr. Charles Alston Collins, brother of Mr. Wilkie Collins. From Higham he would tramp across the fields to Cooling, a village in the marshes, which Mr. Forster has made the unaccountable mistake of supposing to be on the opposite side of the Medway. There are the ruins of an old castle there, and as the dreary churchyard and the adjacent marshes are the scenes of some of the most striking incidents in the story of Great Expectations, I was wishful to follow in the novelist's track, but time forbade and the wish remained, and remains, ungratified. It is in the churchyard of Cooling that the story just mentioned opens, the first chapter introducing Pip to the reader as, when a boy, he sat there alone, a bleak place overgrown with nettles, contemplating by the fading twilight the graves of departed members of his family, and— the dark, flat wilderness beyond the churchyard, intersected with dikes and mounds and gates, with scattered cattle feeding on it, and the low leaden line beyond, which marked where the river ran. Then the escaped convict Magwitch appears on the scene, and with fearful threats coerces the frightened boy into procuring for him a file from the workshop of his brother-in-law, Joe Gargery, with which to remove his fetters. The man and the boy part, to meet again at various turns of the story, and then we have a description of the prospect across the marshes, which brings the scene as vividly before the mind's eye as if we saw it in a picture. The marshes, Pip tells us, were just a long black horizontal line then, as I stopped to look after him and the river was just another horizontal line, not nearly so broad, nor yet so black, and the sky was just a row of long, angry red lines, and dense black lines intermixed. On the edge of the river 
I could faintly make out the only two black things in all the prospect that seemed to be standing upright. One of these was the beacon by which the sailors steered, like an unhooped cask upon a pole, an ugly thing when you were near it. The other, a gibbet, with some chains hanging from it, which had once held a pirate. A visit to cooling, having been, reluctantly on my part at least, voted impracticable, we trudged on towards Strood, recalling as we went all the old stories about Gad's Hill that we had ever heard or read. The road which we were travelling formerly ran between thick woods, the haunt of the robbers, whose frequent depredations procured it the ill repute which it probably had in Shakespeare's time, and which it is known to have had for a century afterwards. John Clavell, in his recantation of an ill-led life, published in 1634, mentions, "'Gad's Hill and those red tops of mountains where good people lose their ill-kept purses.' In 1656 the Danish ambassador was robbed on Gad's Hill, and on the following day received a letter from the marauders in which they informed him that the same necessity that enforced the Tartars to break the wall of China compelled us to wait on your excellency at Gad's Hill. Later Falstaffs and Bardolfs these, for the letter indicates plainly that they had received an education which in those days only men of quality could attain. Twenty years later, a highwayman named Nix, or Nixon, is said to have robbed a traveller on this part of the road at four o'clock in the morning, and ridden the same day to York, where, at a quarter to eight in the evening, he was playing bowls, as was afterwards deposed on his trial for the robbery. This story exceeds in its demands upon the elasticity of our power of belief the similar story which has been told of the highwayman Turpin, who is said to have performed the feat of riding from London to York between the close of the afternoon of a summer day and eight o'clock on the following morning. Both performances must be regarded as apocryphal, however much the spirited narrative of Mr. Harrison Ainsworth, aided by the false glamour which he has thrown around his hero, may interest us. Such a task as covering nearly two hundred miles in sixteen hours, and in the case of the Kentish highwayman, it would have been two hundred and twenty-six, is beyond the powers of any horse that ever was foaled. When the possibility of the feat was rediscussed on the occasion of the equestrian task accomplished by Lieutenant Zubovitz, in riding from Vienna to Paris in less than fifteen days, Mr. Harrison Ainsworth replied to those who questioned the possibility of the feat attributed to Turpin, that Osbaldiston was of a different opinion and that the squire was a good judge of such matters. But though that famous equestrian rode two hundred miles at Newmarket in ten hours and three quarters, he was not limited to any number of horses, and used no fewer than twenty-eight in the accomplishment of his task. So also, when in 1759 a gentleman named Shafto rode fifty miles in less than two hours, the horse was changed ten times, and when, two years afterwards, he made a bet that he would find a man who should ride one hundred miles upon each of twenty-nine consecutive days, it being stipulated that the rider was not to have more than one horse upon each day, John Woodcock, by whom the arduous undertaking was accomplished, used fourteen horses. The course selected was from Hare Park to the ditch at Newmarket, and thence across the flat to the end of the Cambridgeshire course, and back to Hare Park, and it was marked out along its whole length with posts and lamps. Very different were the conditions under which Nixon and Turpin are said to have performed their equestrian exploits. The roads were not so good in the seventeenth century as they are now, and Turpin had not the advantage of lamps along the course of his nocturnal ride as John Woodcock had and the moon would have been of little service to him, where the road was overhung by trees. The strongest point of contrast is, however, that both the traditions concerning Nixon and the story of Turpin's ride 
represent the distance as being ridden upon one horse. It happens that a similar feat was attempted in 1773 by two gentlemen named Walker and Hay, who, having a dispute over their wine concerning the merits of their respective horses, agreed to decide it by riding from London to York. Walker's horse dropped, utterly exhausted, six miles from Tadcaster, but Captain Mulcaster, who rode Hay's mare, reached Ouse Bridge at York and won the wager. The time, however, was forty hours and a half instead of sixteen, and the winner of the wager did not perform Turpin's feats of leaping over donkey carts and turnpike gates by way of interlude. From this digression, let us return to the pilgrims on the dusty road to Rochester. Dickens has, in his paper on tramps, described a piece of Kentish road, which I think may be recognised in a section of the road which we were now travelling. I have my eye, he says, upon a piece of Kentish road bordered on either side by a wood, and having on one hand, between the road dust and the trees, a skirting patch of grass. Wild flowers grow in abundance, and it lies high and airy, with a distant river stealing steadily away to the ocean like a man's life. To gain the milestone here, which the moss, primroses, violets, bluebells, and wild roses would soon render illegible, but for peering travellers putting them aside with their sticks, you must come up a steep hill, come which way you may. So all the tramps with carts or caravans, the gypsy tramp, the show tramp, the cheap jack, find it impossible to resist the temptations of the place and they all turn the horse loose when they come to it, and boil the pot. Bless the place! I love the ashes of the vagabond fires that have scorched its grass. On that strip of grass, blackened here and there with the ashes thus apostrophized, the novelist may have seen, and not improbably talked with, the originals of Dr. Marigold and Chops the Dwarf, and the pink-eyed albino lady, and Codlin and Short, and many more of the characters that figure in his stories. There ran through the whole of his kindly nature a strong vein of sympathy with all strollers of this class, which reveals itself in many passages of his works, and in none more plainly than in the appeal of Sleary, the lisping circus proprietor, to Mr. Gradgrind, "'People must be amused. They can't always be a-learning.' No, they can't always be a-working. They aren't made for it. You must have us. Do the wise thing, and the kind thing, too, and make the best of us, not the worst. But for another class of tramps, which is numerously represented all through the summer upon this road, and upon all the main roads of the county, indeed, and of which there are many casual notices in David Copperfield and the mystery of Edwin Drood, he had no sympathy whatever. Of such is the ruffianly tinker who beats his wife and robs David Copperfield of his handkerchief. It may be that some of these vagrants work occasionally, in a desultory manner, and by way of relieving the monotony of mendicancy, in the hayfields in June, in the cherry orchards in July, in the cornfields in August, in the hop gardens in September, but their favourite occupation is begging, for which purpose they assume the character of unfortunate artisans, or labourers in quest of employment, and in the greatest distress. They have invariably either eaten nothing since yesterday, or sold their waistcoat to buy a bit of bread for their breakfast. Twenty years ago I met on this road, while walking from Gravesend to Rochester, a brace of rascals, who, asking my pardon for arresting my progress, told such a doleful tale of destitution and distress, journeyman tailors they called themselves, and assured me they had never begged before, but were driven to it by hunger, not having yet broken their fast, that I bestowed sixpence upon them and they went their way, invoking the blessing of heaven upon me for my charity. Returning to Gravesend a few hours afterwards, 
I saw the same men sitting at a table before the Sir John Falstaff, with long pipes in their mouths and a quart of ale before them, which one of them lifted on recognising me, calling in an impudent manner as I passed, "'Will you drink, old man?' and at Gravesend I learned that these men lived during the summer by tramping backward and forward between that town and Strood, telling to unwary travellers the story they had told to me. The gypsy tramp, whose tent and little tilted cart was formerly so constantly present a feature on the wastes of Kent and Surrey, is now an almost extinct variety of the nomad tribes who perambulate the roads of the southeastern counties during the summer. The tent and the cart may still be seen on commons and in green lanes, but the owners will generally be found to be indigenous vagabonds, wandering from place to place and obtaining a livelihood as hawkers or tinkers, and not veritable gypsies. The last specimens of the Romany tribe who came under my observation were two young women whom I saw three or four years ago tramping over Thames Ditton Common and I have not seen any considerable assemblage of gypsies since the days of my youth, when, upon one occasion, I smoked a pipe with a party numbering between twenty and thirty persons, being the only house-dweller present. At that time I heard many stories of the gypsy Lees and Coopers, much of my early life having been passed in what was then the hamlet of Norwood, and a very favourite resort of these nomads, but has long been absorbed into the southern suburbs of the metropolis. The two Lees, father and son, who were hanged at Horsemonger Lane on conviction of a petty robbery at Hersham, notwithstanding a very general belief that they were innocent, and that the prosecutrix was mistaken as to their identity with the offenders, were well and not unfavourably known to many respectable members of a generation which has passed away. An old inhabitant of the village of Streatham told me forty years ago that he and Adam Lee, the elder of those unfortunate men, had often played the fiddle together at balls given by farmers and others in that neighbourhood, and, familiar in their mouths as household words with that generation, were the stories of the gallon measure of gold which Adam Lee was said to have given to his daughter on her wedding day, and of the guineas and seven shilling pieces which, fashioned into buttons, the old Romany wore on his coat and vest. A story very characteristic of the gypsy race used to be told, longer ago than I can remember, by a great-uncle of mine, a Kentish farmer, concerning Tom Lee, the younger of the two men who suffered for the Hersham robbery. One of the farmer's horses had been stolen, and almost as a matter of course in those days a gypsy was supposed to have been the thief. The farmer, meeting Tom Lee one day, expressed to him this suspicion, and perhaps hinted a little too broadly that Tom was not unlikely to have been the offender. "'Well, Master Sharp,' said the gypsy, "'I didn't have the horse, but I know where he is, and if you like I'll steal him for you.' At a later period Gypsy Stevens, a quiet, well-conducted man, was a well-known figure at the Kent and Surrey fairs, at which he was a regular attendant with a drinking and dancing booth, of which his two dark-eyed daughters were not among the least attractions, though I never heard the slightest imputation upon their fair fame. Another gypsy celebrity of that day was Mother Cooper, maternally related to the pugilist of that name, and of considerable renown as a fortune-teller, in which character she was allowed the entree of the Beulah Spa Gardens, a fashionable resort of forty years or more ago at Norwood, where she became a house-dweller, and died at an advanced age in very comfortable circumstances, as was often the good fortune of the gypsies of that generation. From these recollections, which arise naturally from reflection upon the ashes of the vagabond fires by the wayside, let us return to our pilgrims, who, telling old stories as they trudge onward, have by this time reached Frinsbury Hill. What a scene opens before us as we reach the brow of the hill, and begin to descend into the valley of the Medway! Before us, at the bottom of the hill, lies Strood, 
in which neighbourhood, which Mr. Forster calls that prettiest, quaintest bit of English landscape, it was the original intention of Dickens to open the story of Bleak House. Beyond the old houses at our feet, Rochester Bridge spans the broad river, above the rocky right bank of which rises the massive ruins of the old Norman stronghold, which for ages has frowned upon the stream below. And beyond the ruins, backed by the clear blue sky, we see the towers of the yet more venerable cathedral. Such a view is to be found at few spots in England, and we feel, as we pause to gaze upon it, that it is of itself worth the pilgrimage. End of chapter 2